this is the workshop uh, entitled Solving Crime Through Linguistics, uh, organized by our department, uh, the Department of English. Um, let me see. Um, Chris said that it is okay, but I see something blocking some parts of the PPT. Oh, that might be the chat box. I don't know. I wonder if that's the chat box. Um, because I have the chat box open so that I can see your responses. Um, but I don't know if that's the reason uh, why some parts of the PowerPoint screen um, are blocked. Maybe you can tell me more, um, you know, if you still have this issue. Uh, but thanks a lot, Chris, for telling me. Um, because um, obviously I don't really know what you see. So it's very important that I get to know what's uh, um, wrong. Now it's okay to see. Oh, thank you, Chris. Okay. So, um, well, I'll try to uh, put the chat box uh, in a sort of hidden place. Um, I, I don't know if it if it interferes with the uh, PowerPoint slides, but let's uh, hope that uh, it works for you. But any time during this workshop, uh, if there is any problem, any technical issue um, that you uh, would like to tell me, please do uh, shoot right away, okay? So uh, let's make a start. All right. Um, this is about solving crime and uh, obviously uh, for those of you who are here, uh, you're interested in crime solving. Uh, before that, uh, let's have a little bit of a um, warm up um, to get to know you better uh, and also to sort of um, get you into this idea uh, that words can be revealing. Okay, so what I want you to do is to have a look uh, at some of these examples that I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, these are very short examples of language that people have produced in the past. And I want you to tell me whether you can recognize uh, who produced that. Is that clear? So you know what I'm asking, right? Can you give me um, a bit of response? Nobody, I can't hear or see anyone responding. So does it mean that you don't know what I'm saying or do you need more instructions? Anyone? Am I talking to anyone at all now? Ah, I am saying that, um, well, I am going to show you some examples of language um, you know, just a string of words in each case. And then I want you to tell me whether you can tell who said these. Okay, so that's that. Okay, not too difficult, I promise. Okay, so let's start with the first um, saying, if you like. Okay, just four words. You're a wizard, Harry. So anyone, is there anyone who has any idea uh, who produced this particular saying? If you don't know or if you don't have any clue at all, don't, don't forget that you have Google, you have the internet with you. So you can easily just um, Google it uh, and I'm sure you can quickly find an answer. Oh, yes, that's good. Uh, basically, um, well, that's from the book uh, Harry Potter, right? So um, what is interesting is that, well, we only have four words here, right? So it's not exactly, you know, a letter or a very long text. So how do you know that? How do you know if you didn't Google it, if it was just from your own intuition, then how did you work out who produced this? What what was the clue for you? From pronunciation, um, maybe if you can elaborate a little bit more, which word in particular um, gives you this idea? What is to do with the pronunciation? So you're a wizard, Harry. So why is it? 
Harry, right? Okay, so some of you said it's Harry, this particular word, uh, because Harry is a character in the book, right? So yeah, so here we have a word, um, a proper noun uh, to be exact, which gives us away uh, the identity or the possible identity of the speaker. And probably when Chris says something about pronunciation, maybe it's to do with this spelling, your, Y-E-R, uh, which kind of conveys a more informal tone. So yes, so some of these words can give you a hint of who uh, the writer may be. So next, okay, so you get the idea now. Let's have a look at another example. This time, this one. This should be very simple. I'm sure um, many of you have recognized this instantly. So what about this particular string of words this time well if you will probably just three or four words i'm loving it so that's uh, from from um, the restaurant right mcdonald's so why is it that we know that how do you get this idea that is from this particular restaurant why do you know it's this restaurant but not the other restaurant famous for frying chicken for example why why do you know this anyone is it memory so probably because you have um, heard this many times in the past maybe you have seen this uh, on the television uh, maybe you have also heard it you know um, in different kind of situations uh, marketing promotional materials and so on right um, so again you can see that sometimes it's not just people it's not just one person that we're dealing with it can be for example a person like harry potter or a character in harry potter but it can also be associated with a company so words can tell you the identity of a particular corporation as well iconic yes it's iconic because uh, obviously um, it uh, stays in your memory for a long time now next let's look at this um, example okay what about this one may the force be with you so this time it's a little bit longer six words if you like um, what do you think about this one so that's from the Star Wars right so um, again um, why do you know that uh, probably because of your experience watching the movie right and also probably because um, just like what Chris said before to do with the McDonald's slogan it's so iconic that you probably have encountered it many times before um, also what is interesting about this uh, saying is that um, it has a kind of religious feel to it right why do I say so what do you think um, do you think that it gives you some sort of association in relation to religion if that's the case then what kind of words give you that idea why do you think that this kind of language if you like is um, quite often associated with religion what kind of words or what kind of structure makes you feel that anyone no idea um, well I would say that you know this word may the modal verb may um, is very often used um, to start a, a sentence um, you know in uh, religious sayings for example if you look at the Bible uh, you can sometimes see this kind of example. Uh, so may the force be with you. Uh, this kind of blessing, you know, very often you can see that in uh, a religion setting. So um, what I want to show you through these very short three examples is that you can see that words, they are very powerful. Not only uh, do they allow you to identify a person, but sometimes identify a company or a movie. Um, so words are very important resources that we use for communication. So when you use them, you should be careful uh, because they may give you away, you know, in important situations, including, um, you know, in crime uh, scenes. So uh, just a few more examples if you, um, 
well. Uh, this one, tremendous. I wonder if you know anything about this word or the use of this word. And um, this word is very often used by a very famous person, a very powerful person in the world. Anyone? Is there anyone who has any idea who likes using this word? Uh, it's a favorite word of one of the most important people in the world right now who has recently uh, been diagnosed with COVID-19. So anyone, is there anyone who has any idea who uses tremendous a lot? I thought that I can't be more specific when I said that uh, he's suffering uh, from COVID-19. No, no one at all. Uh, tremendous uh, is a favorite word of um, Donald Trump. Yes, of Donald Trump. Uh, he uses it very often in a particular pronunciation. So again, uh, of course, uh, if it's just this, maybe, you know, on this particular screen, uh, it may not ring a bell to you. Uh, but if you uh, actually listen to his uh, exact pronunciation, maybe in context, uh, then that might bring back your memory. Oh, yes, uh, that's one of the words that he uh, very often uses. Um, and uh, of course, he also creates words sometimes like, uh, you know, some of these words which are so weird that nobody uh, has actually heard of before uh, or the word bigly you know b-i-g-l-y again you know this kind of word uh, semi new words uh, that he created himself uh, and because he's so powerful so that's why you know uh, these words then got um, circulated uh, what about this? So sometimes it doesn't need to be just one single word. It doesn't need to be just, you know, lexical. It can also be phrasal. Like in this case, uh, we have three words forming a phrase. So one more thing. Do you know uh, this expression? Uh, this was made famous uh, by one of the most innovative thinkers uh, in our age. Uh, sadly, uh, he has passed away uh, a few years ago. Uh, but his company still remains very influential and important. Uh, probably you have um, got some of his products in your uh, bag uh, right now. So anyone, do you know which person um, said this or made this famous? Anyone? Any? Oh, yes. Oh, I can hear someone. Oh, that's great. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, that's uh, uh, from uh, Steve Jobs. Uh, that was a saying that he often used uh, to kickstart his product launch. Uh, well, not really to kickstart, but at the end of his product launch, uh, when, you know, he wanted to introduce an additional and a uh, great feature, then he would use this uh, in order to, you know, to say, oh, there's one more excellent um, function of our phone and so on. Okay, so that's another example. Uh, what about this one, once upon a time? Uh, this is not so much to do with a particular person or company, uh, but what does this um, tell you? So, for example, if you see this particular phrase, um, yeah, you think that is the opening of a story, right? Uh, particularly, it's probably a particular type of story, um, fairy tales, right? Very often um, we see when there is a fairy tale, then it starts with this expression, once upon a time. Um, so what is interesting is that, you know, sometimes um, an expression uh, does not only tell you something about the identity of a person or a company, but it also tells you uh, the particular text type that you're encountering. Is it a business letter? Is it a fairy tale? Is it a contract? And so on. And in this specific case, we also know that this actually uh, very often occurs at the beginning, uh, as Chris said, uh, it's the opening of a story. Uh, what about this? This is to do more with um, pronunciation this time. So we have um, a word uh, in IPA symbols, uh, IPA International Pronunciation Association symbols, um, representing 
the pronunciation of the same word in two different geographical regions. So can you tell me the word? So what is the word? Let me see if anyone knows anything about IPA symbols. Anyone? Can you? Yes, very good. So uh, Chris got it right. Uh, tomato or tomato. Uh, the first pronunciation uh, on the top that said tomato uh, and the bottom tomato. Um, of course, you can then see that uh, they represent uh, the pronunciation of the same word uh, in two regions. One is the UK, uh, the top one, and uh, tomato, uh, the US. Um, so again, um, not only can you tell the identity uh, of a person by uh, a word, but also sometimes just by the pronunciation, you can tell where that person come from. So like, you know, uh, maybe from um, the United States or from the United Kingdom. Okay, finally, just one more example for you. Uh, this one is more to do with uh, age, I would say, uh, based on recent linguistic research. Uh, like is a word that um, has been uh, very uh, frequently used by younger people. Uh, of course, it's a very popular word anyway, and it serves many functions. Uh, but if we use it as a kind of pragmatic marker, meaning that it's just to do with like, you know, inserting this little word uh, between other words um, in order to fill space, uh, or sometimes in order to introduce a quote, then this word seems to be uh, particularly uh, popular among younger people like. Um, so you can see again, when we look at words, they are very powerful because they can tell us a lot of information about the producer. So, um, well, I just want to uh, do this so that I can hear something from you and also to get to know you better. Um, if you have any examples yourself of language frequently used either by you yourself or your friend or friends, or your family or anyone you know at all, like the examples that I've just given, can you share with us on the chat box? Um, because I'm sure you will come up with, um, you know, very interesting examples. Uh, so that's a great chance for us to, to share some of these. So I'll give you um, probably a minute or two so that you can think of these examples and then type them in the chat box um, to share with us, okay? Yes, um, of course. Uh, it is a very interesting example, Chris, uh, because um is sometimes called, um, you know, a kind of feedback channel, or sometimes it can be used as a filler. Uh, if it's a feedback channel, then it means that, you know, sometimes when people are talking to you, you may use um to address that speaker. You may say that, well, I follow you. I hear what you say. So that's one example of this function. Uh, another uh, function, as I said, is to do with um, using it as a filler. So for example, when I'm now speaking and then suddenly I'm running out of words, I don't know what to say, then I might use um between words uh, in order to give me more time to think. So that's a very good uh, example. And uh, can you tell me who often uses this? Is that you or your friend or all of us? Oh yes, all of us, that's true. So, so in a way, um, it is a very useful word uh, because it um, is used by everyone. Uh, but at the same time, you can argue then from the point, from the point of view of identifying uh, who that producer is, uh, then it may not be uh, the most useful word. However, um, it may be used with some other words together. So let's say some people might say something like, um, let me check. So every time when that person uh, uses the word um, uh, he or she may use let me check as well, just after it. Then together, it may be revealing of the identity of the speaker. 
Uh, Amelia, Amelia also uh, tell me something. Oh, it's interesting because I noticed that uh, many of you actually uh, tell me something uh, privately uh, on the chat box. Uh, but if you don't mind, uh, of course, it's up to you. But if you don't mind, it's also great if you can uh, put um, your contributions uh, in the public chat box as well, uh, so that other people can also see uh, your contributions because they are really great. Uh, input. So Amelia um, tell, tells me that it would be inappropriate uh, to use um. um. Yes, because I guess what it means is that, you know, when you use it too often, that it can be distracting. Uh, that's true. Um, Oh, no, we can't. There is no that. Oh, I didn't realize that. Thanks, Chris. I didn't know that. Oh, okay, so so that's um, okay. Uh, in, in that case, then I will. Well, I'll tell you, uh, maybe uh, we have some technical um, consideration. Uh, but thanks a lot for telling me, Chris. So uh, I, I will uh, tell everybody uh, your contribution. That's great. Um, oh. Oh, sorry, Amelia, I uh, misunderstood you. Oh, you mean using uh, like swear words? Yes. So, for example, people might use swear words a lot, uh, but of course, uh, that's uh, considered socially inappropriate uh, in some situations anyway. Uh, but what is interesting is that swear words, of course, can also be revealing of one's identity. Um, you may not uh, realize that, uh, but swear words can be very distinctive and also their combinations. Like, for example, when you use particular swear words with other swear words together, uh, they can actually be quite revealing of who you are. Um, so that's great. Thank you very much uh, for all your contributions. I really appreciate them. They are all very interesting. So now uh, I think we should move on. Uh, what I want to do today, really, uh, is to tell you something about how we can solve crime through linguistics, uh, through the study of language. So linguistics is the study of language and forensic linguistics is to do with anything uh, about using language knowledge, using linguistics knowledge in order to solve crime. So uh, what does it mean uh, by this term anyway, forensic linguistics? It sounds so technical. So um, broadly speaking, we can divide this area into three uh, smaller categories. Okay, one is to do with uh, the written language of the law. Uh, that's to do with, for example, uh, when we are dealing with uh, the Constitution, like, for example, the US Constitution or the Hong Kong Basic Law uh, and all the associated statutes, ordinances, and so on. Um, you probably know that uh, the law um, has very specific formats, uh, requirements, and so on. So the language, fe the language features of the law are very distinctive. Um, one of the things that you probably um, has, have noticed in the past is to do with the fact that, you know, many of these uh, examples of legal language, they are very long, okay? So they are like, you know, a few lines long. And even if you have no experience with the constitution or with the law, I'm sure when you have, for example, installed an app, then they will give you this agreement that you need to read. And you notice, I'm sure, that it's usually very long, you know, with a lot of technical words that, you know, you probably don't understand. So these are the features of the law. Uh, and forensic linguistics um, is interested in this area. Another area is to do with the interaction in the legal process. So when you think about the legal process, like, for example, when something happens, uh, when there is a crime, then um, what we need to do uh, from the very beginning is probably uh, you will need to report the crime, right? So you will need to make an emergency call and then somebody will investigate, you know, the police will come and then they will investigate. Um, and what does it mean? It means that they will also have interviews with the witnesses, right? 
Uh, and then after the police investigation, then what we will have um, is probably a, a courtroom um, procedure. Like for example, you may need to go to the court um, and then you know you will need to um, make a statement uh, as a witness, you will need to testify in court. Um, so all these are to do with interactions in the legal process. Uh, finally, uh, another area is to do with the work as um, expert witnesses. So forensic linguists, people who are interested uh, in studying the language involved in uh, crime solving, um, they very often work as experts. Uh, and it is this area that I'm going to focus on today with you. So what does it mean by uh, expert witnesses? Um, I don't know if you um, watch Netflix. Um, a while ago, probably maybe a year ago or so, uh, there was this uh, series on Netflix uh, called uh, Unabomber. Uh, it's quite popular and a very good series. Um, it was about uh, a bomber, so someone who made and also planted bombs all around the United States. Um, so he was a terrorist, okay? So uh, what he did was he made all these bombs, he put them somewhere and then, you know, he killed people with these bombs. Um, what happened was that uh, he uh, wrote a long document uh, that he called a manifesto uh, to outline, to explain his beliefs and why he did this. Um, and this is uh, based on a real case, okay, so it's not just uh, a fictional television series, uh, but it was actually um, a real case uh, in the United States. Uh, so um, he explained uh, his ideas. And then uh, what happened was that uh, there were linguistic experts uh, who were involved in the investigation. Uh, and also there were people who tried to understand, you know, what he said, what he wrote in the manifesto in that long document. And then eventually, uh, from what he wrote, uh, they found out who the Unabomber actually was. So uh, that's an example of how um, forensic linguists uh, can make use of their expertise and knowledge in crime solving. Um, so that's a, a kind of consultant, if you like. Uh, and other kind of uh, expert witness role is to do with uh, court witnesses. So uh, again, you probably have seen it on TV before uh, when there are these um, linguistic experts, uh, they testify in court, you know, based on what they know, they analyze texts uh, written by victims, written by murderers, and so on, criminals. Uh, and then what they do is that they um, make use of their linguistic expertise uh, to tell the court what they have found in order to help solve the crime. So um, what specifically do they do then, uh, you may ask? So for example, uh, sometimes when we are dealing with uh, um, important texts, like for example, uh, when someone passes away, there is a will, uh, we may be interested in knowing whether the will uh, is indeed written by the deceased, the person who is dead, uh, or is it actually fake, okay, someone else produced it. So we can actually analyze this will, uh, or sometimes it can be a suicide note. So someone decides that, you know, he or she wants to kill himself and then leave a message. So is it really that the suicide case, sorry, the suicide note is real? Or is it the case that someone else has pretended to be the person who commits suicide and then, you know, just try to pretend that it's a suicide case? Um, and other kind of documents that we're interested in is to do with police statements. Uh, these are, um, again, uh, authentic statements. Um, from um, One is from the UK, the other is from the US. 
um, again, when we are dealing with police statements, what we are interested in is, are these statements indeed um, the true representations of the witnesses or the criminals? Or are they actually uh, just made up? Um, this is very important because police statements, they are legal documents and they um, are instrumental. They are very important in uh, prosecuting someone or trying to um, acquit someone, right? So if we want to prove whether someone is guilty or innocent, we want to make sure that the police statements are really authentic. They are true uh, to whatever they should represent. Um, okay, finally, another kind of uh, document that we might be interested in is to do with the documents created by criminals. Like, for example, here, uh, we have a text uh, produced uh, by someone who uh, was involved in a kidnapping case. Uh, kidnapping, when you tried to take away someone, um, maybe a child, um, and then uh, you want to get some money from the victim's family uh, so that, you know, you will release that kid. Um, so that's a, um, a kidnap and ransom case. You can see here, if we look at this ransom note, um, we can see quite a lot of distinct features. Um, if you look at this, you know, uh, maybe it's not so easy to read, but you can see it's very specific. It's in, it's in its content, for example, it says something like, you know, have $50,000 ready, uh, $25,000 in $20 bills and so on. So um, we can analyze, of course, the content and we can also all, um, analyze um, you know, the kinds of words that people use. Um, are they well educated? Uh, what, what about the spelling? Um, are they standardized? Uh, or, you know, what about other kinds of things like punctuation marks or other symbols? These are things that we're interested. So, um, today we are going to try to solve crimes. Uh, let's see how much time we've got. Um, I think we'll probably um, do the first couple of things, if possible. Um, I have already introduced to you the scope of, of, uh, of uh, sorry, the scope of forensic linguistics. Uh, we will try to understand more about authorship, authorship studies in a minute. Um, and then we'll see if we have time to uh, solve a murder case through analyzing text messages. Um, I don't really think that we have time for a missing person case, unfortunately. Maybe you need to join me for next time. Um, so what we'll do now is to tell you something about authorship studies. Um, authorship, as the name suggests, uh, that's to do with working out who the author or the writer is, right? So I want to tell you uh, or introduce to you an expert in this field, uh, Dr. Uh, Tim Grant from um, Aston University uh, at, um, in the UK. Um, he uh, is um, uh, an expert in this area. Uh, and he does work with the police um, on a number of uh, cases. So uh, we are going to watch this very short clip um, when he is going to tell you something about, uh, sorry, about authorship studies. So um, let's have a look. Uh, please pay attention. It's very short, uh, but uh, I'm sure you can learn something from it. Oh yeah, before that, just this. Um, so you can see this is uh, an article that he has written. Uh, and it's on uh, forensic linguistics uh, to do with the question types in police interviews. Okay, so um, before we play the interview, uh, sorry, before we play the video clip, uh, just to show you these two short uh, questions so that you know what to expect. So in the um, clip, um, he is going to tell you something about the two areas of authorship studies, and also uh, he will tell you uh, what we can uh, identify through authorship studies. Okay, so uh, let's uh, watch this. And what are you looking for when you analyze text, when you analyze? Okay, so one of the things we do is provide uh, evidence for the police. And we can look for socio-demographic features, um, so indicators as to what the sort of person is who's writing the language, are they a man or a woman? Are they um, from a particular social background, maybe what their age is? 
And also we do comparisons sometimes. So if we have an anonymous letter, can we say by studying um, uh, known writings of the, the suspect, whether the, the suspect wrote the anonymous letter? Okay, so that's uh, Dr. Tim Grant for you. Um, okay, so um, in this very short video clip, uh, he talked about two issues. Um, to do with authorship studies. Um, there are two main areas, as he said. Uh, one is to do with authorship comparison. The other is to do with uh, authorship uh, profiling, okay? So what does it mean, okay? So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it. Uh, authorship comparison, that's to do with when you know one of the authors, okay? So let me show you. Okay, so when you have some documents and you know at least one author, so what it means is that, you know, for the documents that you have with you, uh, you know that some of them, at least, they have been created by one author that you know. So then what you do is you want to compare this known author with the suspect author. So there are other texts that you are not sure who the author might be, and you want to compare these texts with the texts that you already know uh, have been produced by a particular person. So uh, why do we do that, um, you may ask. Uh, one of the reasons why we may do this is because, let's say for example, uh, as I said earlier on, if you have a suicide note, uh, you want to make sure that the suicide note is indeed produced by the person who commits suicide. Um, so what you can do is you can get some um, texts, some messages from the person who commits suicide. You, you know that it's definitely uh, produced by that person. And then you compare these texts with um, that suicide note in order to see the similarities and differences, to see if the similarities are close enough for you to say that, okay, the author, uh, the author of that um, suicide note is indeed uh, the person who commits suicide, okay? So that would be authorship comparison. Um, another area is to do with authorship profiling. That's when you don't know the authors, okay? So you have no known author at all. You just have a lot of documents, but then you don't know who produced it. Then what you want to do is to at least try to understand more about the socio-demographic background of that person. Uh, what does it mean by the socio-demographic background? Uh, it means, you know, things like um, gender, Okay, like, you know, whether that person is male or female, uh, age, whether that person is young or old, uh, or particular social uh, demographic backgrounds, like, for example, just now we say, oh, that person comes from the US, that person comes from the UK, uh, or it can be to do with social class, or it can be to do with, you know, um, religion, or even, you know, uh, where, where that person is educated and so on. So all these are to do with social demographic features. Um, so um, these are very important. And of course, you know, you can imagine if you don't know who the suspect may be, uh, then these features can help you to narrow down the pool of suspects. Um, so what we can see from this very short um, video clip and from the examples that I've given you so far is that um, your use of words is really like your fingerprint. You may not know it, but in fact, it's just like your fingerprint or the DNA. It can reveal your identity. So every time when you use a word or every time when you say something, when you write something, be careful because um, these words can give you away. Um, I think I'll stop here because um, it's time. Um, sadly, uh, because uh, at the beginning we have to wait for a bit, um, we won't have the time to uh, go on to the other activities that I've installed for you. Uh, but I hope that today's workshop gives you an idea uh, of how we can make use of language 
um, and your linguistic knowledge in order to solve crime. If you're interested in this talk, um, then please uh, do stay tuned uh, to our program, to uh, our updates. Uh, very soon at three o'clock, uh, we will have uh, an information seminar um, of our program. And